the the diagnosis was established uh, very quickly um, I, after I'd had an X-ray, which had shown a pleural effusion in my right lung. I'd, I'd had some symptoms, a cough, which I thought was a viral infection for about eight weeks, but because it persisted, I asked my GP for an X-ray. And at that point, he set up very quickly an appointment with a respiratory physician, who in turn set up an appointment with a cardiothoracic surgeon for a biopsy. Um, and really, the, the whole procedure uh, from being referred to having the biopsy took place over about a, a, a week. And I think actually, operationally couldn't have happened any more quickly. So, so technically, things went very swiftly and, and very positively. Um, but it was after I'd had the biopsy, which was again, the anesthetist was round and asked me was I okay. And the third surgeon came around and asked me was I okay after the biopsy. But, but what was interesting was that they all looked very, very despondent about their vi findings. Their findings were on a, a video assisted um, thoracoscopy, so everyone could see my chest, which looked terrible uh, looking at the reports. And increasingly, I became aware of their despondency. So I got more frightened, really, as, as the, that period went on. And uh, I remember the SHO coming into the room. He'd been a, undergraduate student with me for a year or two. I knew him very well. I could tell that he was very, very upset and wanted to talk to me about it. But I, I think he felt that he didn't have the authority to do that. <clears throat> so I I left hospital the next day, still without any clear understanding of what was happening to me, and came home to the kitchen in my house where I opened the discharge summary, um, because I have access to my own records, obviously, and the discharge summary included the phrase, uh, likely malignant mesothelioma, um, patient aware of diagnosis. So, so, so that's how I learned that I had a mesothelioma, reading it in the kitchen table. I, I think it's important to say at this stage that although that wasn't the right way to learn about it, I think, I think everyone was trying to do the right thing the, the first I learned directly that I meant have a mesothelioma was from the specialist cancer nurse who came in to show my wife how to drain the, the, the pleural catheter which is in my right chest and he again acting very conscientiously said to me and my wife if I wanted inf any information about mesothelioma he'd, he'd lots of it available. There was a point where everyone in the team including my wife knew that I had a mesothelioma and I didn't and that can't be right. I think, I think there may have been something in the fact that being a doctor, I've been roughly the same age as these guys. I'm, I'm in my late 50s. Most of the consultants were in their late 50s or 50s, you know. And our kids would be the same age. Um, and this, is, this is completely cut and just diagnosis. So you can see them thinking, God, this guy's out to it. And... <laughs> They just weren't, they weren't brave enough. They weren't brave enough to say, this is really bad news for you. Maybe that they hid behind the science of their biopsy and pathology to avoid confronting the metaphysics of my predicament. I am a man devoid of hope. And I, I just sensed that they hesitated at that point. And my own view is, my own view is, so it's quite hard, is I, I just don't think that's good enough. Medicine is not a, 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 a solely a technical activity and pursuit. Medicine is about understanding and being with people at the edge of the human predicament. Caring for somebody is a transactional activity where they do things to me. Everything that I've had done to me in, in the, our local hospital has been excellent. There has been a single mistake, I'm seen it on time for things transactionally, I think the place is outstanding. It's the relational care where I thought, felt that the experience has been less than satisfactory. And it's been, it's been a mixture of some really shockingly bad interactions 
and some shockingly good interactions, some surprisingly good interactions. But I, again, I want to stress that when people, when I perceive people to be interacting poorly with me, I, I still, and I mean this, I still think they're trying to do their best. I still think they're, they're they think that they're, they're, they don't think that they're actually upsetting me in a particular way. Um, but, but they are. Uh, and my insight into the experience is it doesn't take much to change from upsetting or insensitive communication to communication that puts someone much more at their ease.